can you see my can you all see my first slide on the on, on Habakkuk right um, so the book of Habakkuk uh, along the middle you've got a, a a piece of Latvian traditional Latvian design for textiles um, Jane Norris who I met last week asked me that I should put this on to give her something to look at while I was talking but she's not actually here but never mind uh, nothing very much to do with the book of Habakkuk but it's a Latvian it's a Latvian traditional textile design so um, the Latvian will of course come into this when I'm uh, out shopping or go to visit the doctor or something like that I, I often get asked uh, where my name comes from and uh, the standard reply is it's a Latvian name which I rehearse my parents came to this country after the second world war and then if, I, if I'm feeling in the mood and sort of talkative then I add also uh, that it's a version of the of the name of the prophet Habakkuk on the Old Testament which as you might imagine usually draws a blank stare from the people I'm I'm talking to But anyhow, there is a relationship with, with the prophet Habakkuk. And so uh, I have a, a sort of feel and affection and affinity for the book of the prophet Habakkuk. And I had from time to time looked at it, read through it, thought about it. But in this time of COVID, when there was so much more time, uh, I really, got enthusiastic enough to, to spend sort of a couple of weeks of serious study on it, reading some books about it. So and this so this is how uh, I came to think of giving a Bible study on Habakkuk. Uh, first of all, just uh, where did how did my name uh, arise? Uh, and it's this is a bit speculative. But roughly speaking, I have to give you a little introduction uh, to some aspects of the history of Latvia. In, in the 18th and 19th centuries, what is modern day Latvia was a part of the Russian Empire. But the local landowners, the local aristocracy, were Baltic Germans. The Latvian peasantry had been reduced to the status of serfs. But in the early part of the 19th century, legislation was enacted that emancipated, emancipated them from serfdom. At the same time, and it would be roughly in the 1820s, they were required to choose surnames or perhaps sad surnames assigned to them because up to then when they were serfs and tied to the land and, and to their uh, owners, they, there was no need for them to have surnames. Uh, another element that comes into this is that uh, the first translation of the Bible into Latvian by a German Lutheran pastor had been published in 1694. So when the when the when the, when the names the surnames were being chosen, the, the Latvian Bible had been around for uh, a century or so, and in the in the uh, later editions of that original translation which I've seen uh, what the, the book of ha the, the, the name Habakkuk uh, is written exactly as my surname is spelt Habakkuk's. Uh, I, on, on the screen I've, uh, I've also put it down uh, uh, in, in gothic font because all the Latvian Bibles up, to, up unto the middle of the 20th century uh, were written in gothic script because the Latvian church was basically run by uh, by Germans at least until the until the First World War. So modern translations of the Lat of the Bible in Latvian have have Habakkuk's with an H in front of it. So um, it's just that in the Latvian language the letter H is not used a lot. It's used in relatively recent uh, additions to the Latvian language, but the sound H doesn't really come naturally to the to the Latvian tongue, so Abacux is the is the name of the prophet, uh, at least in in earlier centuries. So, did an ancestor of mine really 
choose the surname Abacups, or perhaps was it assigned to him and why? Um, most Latvians, when they had surnames, were their surnames were names of trees or of animals or of plants, or possibly uh, geographical features or possibly what, what their job was. Um, it was highly unusual uh, to have a surname that was a prophet. In fact, I know of no other instances apart from a few, relatively few Abacuxes in, in Latvia. So if it was chosen by uh, an ancestor of mine, possibly it was just one person choosing that name with, together with his family, perhaps, and we are all that person's descendants. But why should he have chosen the name Habakkuk? The, um, it was the Baltic German clergy who, who, who controlled the church life in Latvia then. But in, um, in 1729, the Moravian church, the Moravian brothers had come to Latvia you know, on missionary activity. And going on from then, there, they, they, there had been a Lat an awakening, a religious awakening among the Latvian peasantry. So there were Latvian peasants uh, who were uh, re religious, devout people. And the Moravians also encouraged them to get at least a rudimentary education and to take leadership role, roles in, the, in their organization so that there were Latvians who had some experience, well, knowledge of the Bible and they were preachers and people who uh, were involved with running their meeting houses. So perhaps it's just possible then that that's how my name arose. Somebody who is perhaps a, a, a devout Christian for some reason, particularly uh, struck by the book of Habakkuk, choosing that as his surname. That's all conjectural, but that's the best guess I have at how the surname arose. So that was really by uh, way of introduction. And now let's go and talk, look at the specifics of, of the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is one of the 12 so-called minor prophets whose short books are grouped together from, to form the Book of the Twelve, the final part of our Old Testament. In the first verse of the Book of Habakkuk, we read the heading, the oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. So right up front, the book is explicitly attributed to Habakkuk, and he is called a prophet. And incidentally, that's even quite unusual in, in the prophetic books in the Old Testament, because even the big books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so on, clearly they're books written by prophets or about prophets. But the title prophet, the prophet Isaiah, or the prophet Jeremiah, doesn't appear, or at least explicitly, at the beginning. But here the prophet Habakkuk is, is quite clearly specified as a prophet. That's, that is what he is known as. Um, and in the third chapter, the, fi the final chapter, um, there is also the heading that this is a prayer of the prophet Habakkuk according to Shigionoth. Now, the word Shigionoth apparently in Hebrew is difficult. The translators don't really know what to make of it. So um, they've just left it in the original. It does appear once in on one other occasion in the Bible uh, in the heading to Psalm 7, which is a psalm of lament. So perhaps Shigionoth denotes a type of musical performance or composition, perhaps a lament. And also at the end of, 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 the, of the book of Habakkuk, at the end of chapter 3, there's a postscript giving an instruction to the choir master. Uh, that the music is to be performed with stringed instruments. So this suggests that Habakkuk may have been involved in liturgical uh, proceedings, that he was associated with the Jerusalem temple, a temple prophet. So he was a, in some sense an official 
prophet uh, in, in the temple. Uh, so presumably not, not a man of, of the wilderness, not the sort of prophet who, who wandered about uh, in, in uh, garments of camel hair, but more of an establishment figure. Again, this is all a bit uh, circumstantial, a little bit speculative. We don't really know what Habakkuk, who Habakkuk was. We haven't, we're not really told anything explicitly about him. We have to try and make out who he was uh, from what we learn in these three brief chapters of his book. So let's now turn to the uh, historical background. Uh, what can we guess about ha Habakkuk? As we'll see in a moment when we, when we turn to the um, text of Habakkuk, he anticipates a Babylonian invasion. He, be he bemoans the evils of the society in which he is living. That's another aspect of, of, what, he of what we know about him. So this, is, this suggests that Habakkuk was probably active during the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, who reigned from 609 to 598 BC, uh, who according to the second book of Kings and the second book of Chronicles, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Although that, of course, was said of many of the kings of Judah. It was a time when the Babylonians were becoming the dominant power in the Near East. So this makes, incidentally, Habakkuk a, a, a contemporary of the prophet Jeremiah. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded Judah in 598, laid siege to Jerusalem, and captured it in 597. Its treasures were taken, and most of its leading citizens, including most of the royal family, its craftsmen, were deported to Babylon. They went into exile. Now about this this um, book, it's we should make, we, we normally think of a prophet as somebody who communicates messages from God to the nation or to individuals, very often leading citizens, especially rulers. Thus says the Lord, the prophet will say. And so it is mainly in the historical and prophetical books of the Bible. But the book of Habakkuk is different. If, if we hadn't been told in the title of the book that Habakkuk was a prophet, it wouldn't be at all obvious that he was. Because uh, it's to a, a big extent a dialogue between the prophet and God. Twice the prophet complains and twice God answers. And we may think of Habakkuk's complaints as an anguished prayer, as a lament. The book of Habakkuk has far more in common with the biblical wisdom literature, especially with the book of Job and with the Psalms than with other prophetic books. As Habakkuk wrestles with the problem of why God allows evil and suffering to persist. The culmination of the dialogue comes with the words that the righteous live by their faith. Uh, that's an important verse in Habakkuk, and, and we, as I'll come to it later on, it, but since it's, a, it's, it's important in later church life as well. Then later in chapter two, there's a sequence of taunts, uh, taunts addressed to the wicked, who will all get their just deserts. Alas for you who heap up what is not your own. Alas for you who build a town by bloodshed and found a city on iniquity and so on. And the final chapter 
In the final chapter, it's called a prayer, but it's a, a hymn, really, a, a psalm. There is a vision of a theophany. That's a that's a, a sort of technical term for me, meaning an appearance of earth on of earth on earth of God in all His majesty and power to save His people. So that's a very dramatic part of the book of Habakkuk in the, in the final section. And but then finally, despite everything that has gone before, and despite the awareness that things may get worse before they get better. There is a triumphant shout of exultation from Habakkuk. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. And incidentally, a condensed version of Habakkuk 3 appears as a canticle in the Common Worship Book of Daily Prayer. When we come to look at the, the text, in summary, it's worth noting that it's that in this short book there are several switches of speaker and frequent changes of mood but overall it follows the prophet's winding journey from distress to serenity and finally joy and we are reassured that it's okay to ask god hard questions about why even if we don't always get answers or answers that satisfy us or that we find comforting so let's now look in more detail at the text of the book of Habakkuk. Uh, I'll have fragments of text up on the screen and um, some of them I'll, or all of them possibly, I'll, I'll read through. So let's look at the beginning. After the, after the first verse, which is just the heading, we have uh, a lament, we might refer to it, a complaint, a lament, an anguished prayer. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise, so the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth, perverted. God replies that apparently, as instruments of his judgment, he will send in the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. Incidentally, the Chaldeans and Babylonians, we can use more or less interchangeably, the Chaldeans are the dominant ethnic group in the Babylonian Empire. They are the ones who are really uh, running the show. So here's God's reply, or part of it. Look at the nations and see. Be astonished, be astounded, for a work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told. For I am rousing the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Dread and fearsome are they. Their justice and dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more menacing than wolves at dusk. Their horses charge. The horsemen come from far away, they fly like an eagle, swift devour, they all come for violence with faces pressing forward, they gather captives like sand, at kings they scoff, and of rulers they make sport. They laugh at every fortress and heap up earth to take it. When they sweep by like the wind, they transgress and become guilty, their own might is their god. Well, this is not good news for Habakkuk, is it? To be invaded by the Babylonians is surely far worse than putting up with the evils of the society that he is living in. He continues to complain, to pour out his anger and despair before God. He questions God. O oh Lord, you have marked them for judgment, and you, O oh Rock, have established them for punishment. Your eyes are too pure to behold evil and you cannot look on wrongdoing. Why do you look on the treacherous and are silent when the wicked swallow those more righteous than they? 
if we read all this as Habakkuk praying to God for an answer, it seems perhaps like the, the desperate prayer of a man in turmoil, turmoil, but still a man of faith in that he is seeking an answer from God. Then, at the beginning of chapter two, there is a remarkable change of tone. Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. I've also quote, given the King James Version uh, uh, of this, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. I bring in this, by the way, as, a, as an alternative, simply just to uh, remind myself and you that there are very many difficulties of translation in the book of Habakkuk, especially in, in, in chapter two, so that you can see that the last line here turns out quite differently in, in the NRSV, in the King James Version. In the, in the NRSV, Habakkuk is waiting for an answer from God, whereas in the King James Version, is expecting God to reprimand him for complaining and, and thinking about what he should answer when he is uh, reproved. Oh, so here's a picture. Um, I'm not totally sure whether this is genuinely from Jerusalem, but it's a, it's a watchtower uh, that's similar to what you would have had on, on the walls of, of Jerusalem. So you can be think of Habakkuk going up on the city walls, perhaps to watch like a sentry, looking out for the coming of a messenger who is bringing vital news, maybe of an invasion by enemy forces. Habakkuk will watch and wait. We might think of him as now adopting a more contemplative form of prayer, quietly watching and waiting for what God will say. And God does answer. And the Lord answered and said, answered me and said, there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. So God will eventually put things right. But, I, but it makes me ask, but when? If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. But it's, it makes me think, how long do we have to wait? In the meantime, though, we are invited to keep you are invited to keep your faith and put your trust in the faithfulness of God. This verse, this, this or this half verse, is is well known. If you if you uh, if you um, read the Pauline epistles. It's quoted at Romans 1.17 and Galatians 3.11. The one who is righteous will live by faith. And it's also quoted in a version in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 37 to 38. So uh, it is, it, 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 this verse is important, has been important, obviously, clearly important to Paul in his argument. And... Uh, is close to the heart of Lutheranism as well, with its emphasis on justification by faith. Then after the taunts to the wicked, in the remainder of chapter two, in chapter three, we have the theophany, Habakkuk's vision of God in his majesty, frightening in its violence, in its description of the judgment, the wrath of God against the enemies of his people. Well, I'll inflict all this on you so you get the atmosphere of it. It's, I find, when I first, when, when I remember first reading it, I sort of was rather 
put off with it, put, put off by it because of that really violent, savage God that we seem to find there. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. The brightness was like the sun. Rays came forth from his hand where his power lay hidden. Before him went pestilence and plague followed close behind. He stopped and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The eternal mountains were shattered along his ancient pathways. The everlasting hills sank low. I saw the tents of Kushan under affliction. The tent curtains of the land of Midian trembled. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord, or your anger against the rivers, or your rage against the sea, when you drove your horses, your chariots to victory? In fury you trod the earth, in anger you trampled nations. You came forth to save your people, to save your anointed. Some aspects of the theophany recall the action of God in the book of Exodus to rescue his people Israel from their slavery in Egypt. And there's an implied promise that God will act again to save his people. We're also perhaps reminded of the, of, of the link of, of Habakkuk to, 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 to the Psalms because there's, there's, a, there's a theophany along similar lines described in Psalm 18. Then, as Habakkuk responds to this vision, there are the final swings in mood. Habakkuk's first reaction is rather like what I might feel about this. I hear and I tremble within my lips, quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones and my steps tremble beneath me. I wait quietly for the day of calamity to come upon the people who, who attack us. So initially terrified, Habakkuk will wait quietly for the enemies of his people to be destroyed. In the meantime, he anticipates that with the Babylonian invasion, the land of Judah will be devastated. So things will get worse before they get better. But he nevertheless ends with a joyful affirmation of trust in good. And this I find a marvellous moving piece of, of, uh, of writing. I, I've from time to time quoted it in my sermons. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no foot, food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stores, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. Finally then, here is the triumph of faith in Habakkuk. That's the name of a book I read about, about the book of Habakkuk, the triumph of faith in Habakkuk. We see joy and trust in spite of all his sorrows. If we think of the book of Habakkuk as a reflection of his prayer life, it seems like that in his prayer he has now been able to rise above his earlier complaints and questionings and simply delight in the presence of his saviour God. So that really ends what I wanted to go through with you on the on the book of Habakkuk I've got one more slide left which is a sort of personal postscript only tangentially related to uh, the book of Habakkuk first of all we might uh, note that what happens uh, after the book of Habakkuk has been uh, written or after what, re what is referred to in the book of Habakkuk, after the fall of Jerusalem comes Babylonian exile. So the next stage in the history of Israel of Judah is, is the exile. And that takes me on to 
uh, my final slide and a, per and a personal uh, reminiscence. Uh, first of all, the um, uh, Nick, when we when he 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 launched this series of Bible studies, um, referred to Psalm 137 right at the beginning uh, of what he said, uh, and here it appears again. But I've, I have my own spin on it, uh, and I. I sort of thinking of what what uh, uh, Adrian was saying uh, last week as we as we move into sort of what might be thought of as old age we remember so much about selectively perhaps about things that happened to us a long time ago and my memory here is um, from the early 1970s so wow 50 years ago when I was a student at the University of Sussex. One day as we sang a hymn at the university service, I was struck by a sense of familiarity and at the same time of strangeness, of being wonderfully moved, but not being quite sure why. And then it struck me that the tune was of a Latvian folk song that I knew well. One of the orphan songs that describes the fate of orphans who serve a cruel master, presumably going back to the period of serfdom. But the words that we were singing, based on Psalm 137, describe the feelings of a community living in exile. It was a part of my identity that though I had been born and brought up in Britain, I belonged to a community and church living in exile. Indeed, our church was called the Latvian Evangelical Lutheran Church in exile. Our country was occupied by a foreign power, hostile to displays of national identity and to the church. But our communities in exile were living scattered throughout the world. At the time, I was, uh, couldn't quite understand how this hymn had come about but the wonders of the internet have allowed me just to, more recently to find out what the, what the history behind this. The, the, the hymn was written by an American Lutheran hymn writer then living in Minneapolis, where presumably he had got to know the Latvian community and its church. So very finally, I'm going to I'm not going to read out the words of the of the of the hymn which you have on the screen, but I will play you the, the tune, the Latvian folk tune, played very slowly, much more slowly than you would be would normally sing uh, on a Latvian uh, folk instrument, the Korkli. So it gives you a couple of this will take take it this will take us very slowly to a conclusion, and perhaps we can think about uh, as we listen to it about this, about the, 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 the people of Judah in Babylonian exile and the Latvians in exile and how and how and if the, the text of the book of Habakkuk that I've that I've briefly taken you through is it relevant to us today how do we react to it or do we just feel in a very strange world that's not very relevant to our problems so listen to the tune Thank mm -hmm. 
How do I get out of this? Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Right. Okay, that's, that's it then. Over to you. I wonder if there are any reactions to this.